you've heard it said over and over and over again, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm still going to repeat it this morning that we are living in very traumatic times. I don't know if traumatic is the word we might want to use. We might want to use a, a, a more expressive adjective, but it, it's an unprecedented time. We have never seen something like this in in all our lives or well i suppose in history there have been times when people might have seen similar things but as far as any of us alive is concerned we have never seen a time like this and it just seems to grow worse every day and of course whether we like it or not sometime we have to we have to relate to it we have to we have to talk about it because to avoid it, you have to come out of the world because it envelops the entire planet. Like I mentioned some time ago, um, they, they took down a couple of my videos from um, YouTube. Well, thankfully, they haven't taken down anymore. But these were videos that were dealing with the gospel. One of them was entitled The Wages of Sin. And they said that um, it it violated their policy concerning self-harm like it would encourage people to commit suicide or something like that they never actually use those words they said it violates their policy of self-harm i wrote to them and I, I i told them it's a it's a video relating to the gospel that christ is the answer to the problems of, of, of that people have and they wrote back to say they had reviewed the, the video and they stopped by their decision so i don't have any argument it's their platform but it, it, it reinforced in my mind the thought of the intolerance that is developing in the world and that a part of this intolerance is the antipathy to Christianity, the antipathy to Christianity. Brother Wayne put up um, a post a few days ago where um, he, he, he posted the policies of YouTube. And one of the things they, they said was that if you try to promote any cure for COVID, then they would that was not approved. Then your post would be taken down. And among the things they said, if you try to suggest to people that prayer is a remedy for COVID, that is one of the bases on which they would remove your video. If you try to suggest that prayer was something that you could use in case you had COVID. They would remove your post. Well, I don't know how you feel about that, but as a Christian, I find it extremely disturbing. Not 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 unexpected, but disturbing anyway. You you know that um based on our understanding of prophecy what i have what i've come to believe as i look at the bible is that the last great enemy of god's people in the end of time is going to be a godless system of government enveloping the entire planet this is what we have been saying for the past few years and so i'm not surprised that i find this intolerance of anything religious i'm not surprised but at the same time it is disturbing and there is the question as to how should we as Christians relate to what is happening in the world? Well, it's very challenging because you want to be a good citizen. And you want to, you want to not create disturbances unnecessarily. But at the same time, it's, it's difficult to see that the thing that you believe in, the thing that you love, the thing that is your entire life is being systematically crushed. That's the way I would put it. It's being systematically, gradually, but systematically crushed by the powers that be. You have to ask the question, how should I respond to this and what can I do about this? Now, I'm going to read a, a, a verse from the scriptures. And um, what I'm going to do is bring up my Bible as usual. And we're going to use it as the basis for what I want to share this morning. Um, let me get rid of this. Always, it's it's in the way. Um, all right, let me share my screen.
All right. I'm going to read this verse from Revelation 21. And I'm going to focus on a particular word in this in this verse. It's, uh, it's Revelation 21 and verse 8. We're all very familiar with this verse, um, like we are with most of the verses. But I want us to examine it a little bit more closely because there's something here I want to I want to emphasize today. It says, "But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death." You notice I have highlighted one word in, in, in the sentence. It's the word fearful. I highlighted it for two reasons. First of all, it's the first thing mentioned. And secondly, it is in the middle of a set of a set of words, a set of vices that we would consider terrible. Look at look at what uh, look at where it is included. Abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. That's a category in which God puts the fearful and the unbelieving. God puts them in the same category as abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. And he, he says that these people will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone in the second death. It's a startling verse, and I know we have considered it before, but just to stop and look at it at this moment, it's, it's, it's startling because it, it, God is saying that to be afraid, just being afraid is reason to have a part in the second death. Just being afraid. I'm emphasizing it because I know that fear is a, an emotion that we find ourselves encountering from time to time. Even the best of us Christians, we find ourselves encountering this emotion of fear. And God says it is so bad that if you if you if you possess this, if this remains with you, it will res result in you being in the lake of fire. You might ask, why is is fear? Why is fear categorized this way by God? Why is it so bad? Well, the reason is because fear is an expression of lack of faith. You know that the one great element that in, of the Christian life, the one great essential, everything revolves around the question of faith. And I'm going to say that fear is an expression of lack of faith. Or maybe we could put it this way, that fear is an expression of a struggle with faith. And as, as we continue to, to share this morning, I'm going, to, I'm going to examine that a little bit more closely. But this is why fear is such a terrible problem that God says those who have it will end up in the lake of fire. Because, you know, George Muller, the great, the great modern day man of faith when i say modern day i mean like nearly 200 years ago but he 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 was a man who was noted to be a person of faith he he recorded 52000 prayers that god answered for him 52000 but george muller said where anxiety begins faith ends where faith begins anxiety ends Anxi anxiety is simply a, a, a modified kind of modified modified kind of fear. It may not go as far as fearful or unbelieving, but anxiety means that your faith is beginning to be troubled. Your be it's beginning to be shaken because you don't jump up and suddenly have un unbelief or, or 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 be fearful. It's a process. It's a development towards a point. So you may not be there, but when you begin to be anxious, you are progressing in that direction. So George Muller says, 
where anxiety begins, faith ends, and where faith begins, anxiety ends. And and the Bible the Bible has so many verses that explains why this is so. If you look at Psalm 23 and verse 4, look at what it says here. Everybody knows this since you were a child. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will do what? I will fear no evil. I will not fear. But look at the reason. For thou art with me. That is the issue, brothers and sisters. This is the issue with fear. This is the issue with anxiety. This highlighted statement on, on the screen here is the center of everything. Thou art with me. How can a person be with God and be afraid? How can God be with a person and a person be afraid? Well, I cannot be with God and be afraid, but God can be with me and I be afraid. Why? Because I don't recognize his presence. Because the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And yet many Christians or professing Christians are afraid. Why? Because even though the Lord is with them, they don't believe. Their faith does not embrace the reality, and so they are fearful. David gives the reason for the fearlessness of a Christian when he says, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of any evil, because you are with me. This is why John says, the Apostle John says, Perfect love casteth out all fear. Perfect love casteth out all fear because love and faith are twin brothers. They go hand in hand. You, you might even say they are Siamese twins. They don't even go hand in hand. They are joined together, faith and love. So, so perfect love necessitates perfect faith. And perfect love casteth out all fear. I'm going, to, I'm going to repeat a thought that the Lord gave me this week. It, while I was in prayer a couple of mornings ago, this, this thought the Lord, the Lord brought to my mind, and it is this. I fear the fear of death more than I fear death. I'm going to repeat it because I think it's, it's worth Considering, I fear the fear of death more than I fear death. And I'll explain to you why. When a person is afraid, whether it is a fear of death or any other fear, when a person is afraid, you know what it is? It is a statement that you are not in the presence of God or you don't recognize the presence of God. When a person is, a, is afraid, it is a statement that you don't recognize the presence of God. And I fear this, I fear this. I fear to live as a Christian. I fear to walk in this world and not be aware of God. I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of anything that makes me consider some solution other than God. I'm afraid of it. I fear this worse than I fear death. I would prefer to die with God than to live without him. This is my heart on display. And I, 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 although I say I, I know there are many of us in this room who can say the same thing. I Amen. Amen. I, I prefer to die with God than to live without him. And that is why I say I fear the fear of death because the fear of death means I've lost sight of my God. The fear of death means I've, I've, stopped, I've stopped walking with God, and I'm afraid of this. It came to me because there were so many people, there have been so many people over the past few weeks who have been, whether speaking to me directly or indirectly, whether I've seen it on the internet or on YouTube or on social media or on WhatsApp, so many attempts to scare me into doing what everybody else is doing. 
and the tool that is being used is fair. Now, I am not this, this morning discussing the remedies for COVID, whether to take a vaccine or not to take a vaccine. I'm not discussing that this morning. I'm fully aware that there are people, even in this room, who have taken the vaccine, and there are people who have not taken the vaccine, and you are still my brothers and sisters, and we have a divided opinion on it. And I'm not going to talk about that this morning. What I'm going to talk about is a fear that drives people to do things. I will tell you that if you, if you take the vaccine because of fear, your motive is wrong, and you are in a dangerous place. And if you don't take it simply because of fear, you are in a dangerous place. This should never be the motivation of a Christian. It should never be the overriding consideration. And those who try to drive fear into you for any reason, they are not the friends of God. God's people walk through the valley of the shadow of death and they fear no evil. You know, there's a saying that goes like this. And it's true. It's not, it's, not, it's not a religious statement, but it, it, we Christians can empathize with it especially. A coward dies a thousand times, a brave man only once. I'm not talking about human bravery, but a man who is in Christ. You, you, you can only die one time, but a coward, he, he dies over and over. He dreams and he dies. He, he, he's scared and he's die, he dies. I mean, he goes through the pains of death because of his cowardice, is what it is saying. Now, that's, that's probably mainly a psychological point, and I won't dwell on it, but it's true. I don't want to die a thousand times over. I want something that can give me a solid foundation to hold on to, that I can live my life as a, as a, as a Christian should live his life, courageous and happy and hopeful and fearless, because I don't walk like other people. I don't live like other people. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I fear no evil. There is a mood in the world today that I refer to as a fear-mongering mood. What it is, is the creation of unbelief. Sister Heather, Sister Heather, who is in the room here, I think now, she, she, she put up a video some time ago that I was I mean, I'm a little skeptical of, of some of these videos because, you know, they are, they, are, they are made by, some of them by these Pentecostal preachers. And there are things there that I don't believe. I'm, I'm wary of them. But the, 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 the gentleman said something that's, that stuck in my mind. I, I watched it and there was something there that I believe is a valuable insight that I, I kind of know, but he brought it to the forefront. And what he said was, the problem we have is not so much a lack of faith. It is the presence of unbelief. Well, you know, I thought about that and I think, well, unbelief is simply the lack of faith. That's what I believe. Unbelief is a lack of faith. But at the same time, it brought something to my mind, which is this. Feeding on things that produce doubt and question. Feeding on something that causes doubt and question is destructive to our faith. Every time you go to a website and they tell you how many people die because they never took the vaccine, or conversely, how many people die because they took the vaccine, let, let me be fair and look at both sides of the picture. But I really, I, I really believe that the emphasis is more. When you go on the internet anywhere, the emphasis is take the vaccine or die. That's the emphasis, if I'm fair. Every time you go, they're pushing fair. And even as a Christian, sometimes I read the stories, you get a little twinge or a little punk. You are being led to think that the only hope you have is doing what the world is promoting you to do, is going ahead and taking this vaccine. Right. I don't want to get too deep into it. I don't want to talk about the vaccine today. I don't. What I'm talking about is faith and unbelief. But what I'm saying is that the bombardment of the news, every night the news comes on at seven o'clock and 
My wife likes to listen to the news. And sometimes I go and sit and watch with her and it is depressing. Every single night, they will carry a story of somebody who died or how many died. And usually it is accompanied by the, 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 the fact they were unvaccinated. There was a politician who, who his wife died recently and they, they made you know KD Knight. They made you know his, his wife was unvaccinated and so was his daughter, but he was vaccinated. His wife ended up dead. His daughter is in the hospital and he's okay. Over and over and over and over. It, the, the stories that drive fear into you as a Christian, the information begins to erode your confidence. It begins to erode your confidence in certain things. And, and little by little, you come to the place where you face a crisis and you're thinking, God will get me through this. But what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? Unbelief comes in and begins to butter your faith. This week, let me show you this. Let me show you something that happened this week. And most of you probably know of it. But um, this appeared in the news this week. This gentleman was the, the vice president of the largest Seventh-day Adventist university in the Caribbean. He's Newton Cleghorn, Dr. Newton Cleghorn. He, 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 was a, he was a childhood acquaintance of mine. I, when I used to go to high school, we used to be on the road together. He went to the Adventist school and I went to the government school, Cornwall College. He went to, um, uh, he went to Harrison Memorial. But, you know, then he, he actually went on to become an Adventist pastor and became a part of the university family. And he died. And it tells you he dies from COVID complications. Now I want to read, I'm going to read a couple of messages that came out um, concerning what happened to this gentleman. Um, let me see. Just a second. All right, I, I, I need to close again to bring up the next screen. All right, first of all, here is a message that came in to my family's WhatsApp group. I have a, we have a Clayton WhatsApp group, and this came in. You know, some of my members are pushing for us to be vaccinated, some are not. It's even in the, even in the family, there is a division of opinion. This message came from an SDA minister. And of course, one brother posted it. He said, I'm just recovering from COVID-19 from an SDA minister, along with my wife and children. We were hard hit and the death was beckoning us welcome. It was an ordeal to say the least. I'm thankful to God I'm still here to help my brethren. The fact is, we speak lightly and nonchalantly against taking the vaccine while we are healthy and strong. But when we contract the virus, it is a different tune. And so I'm encouraging my friends. It's no more about will we take the vaccine, but instead, how soon? And I'm just here speaking from my experience. Why suffer night and days and weeks and months when you don't have to? For many that have taken the vaccine, they contract the virus. They have an occasional sneeze and fever for a day or two. Then they bounce back rapidly and are back to business as usual before long. The person who contracts the virus but was left naked without the vaccine, how they suffer? and in many cases die, it's not worth it. In fact, if you had the opportunity to get the vaccine and did not, and you contract the COVID-19 virus, then for 99% of the time, you will live to regret it, period. And so I'm encouraging every family member, their relatives and their cat, please take the vaccine and thank God you live long enough to take it, for you too could be history today. If you cannot take the vaccine for some medical reasons, my tears flow for you. It's a fearful thing to live in an age 
of a sweeping deadly plague and be left unprotected. I highlighted this part. This is from an Adventist minister. And he says, if you can't take the vaccine, all I can do is cry for you because you are living in an age of a sweeping deadly plague and you are unprotected. This is what a supposed servant of God can tell you that if you don't get the vaccine, you have no protection and all he can do is cry for you. As a Christian, I am grieved when I read things like this and it is sent out, it is sent out to Christians everywhere to do what? To break your faith, to make you, make you understand that God cannot help you. It's foolish, it's naive, it's childish to believe that God can intervene and, in, in something like this. Concerning the death of Pastor Clegon, here's what, 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 uh, what a couple of messages say. Prominent SDA pastor, Dr. Newton Clegon, Dean of Student Affairs at Northern Caribbean University, has just died of COVID. He was unvaccinated, doing home remedies with his nurse wife, and strongly relied on his faith to keep him from dying from COVID. Well, he's now dead, gone, sleeping till Jesus comes. A death that could have been avoided if he took the vaccine. From another person, Cleghorn's wife is now in hospital. I gather that he said that God is his protector. He's not taking the vaccine. God is our protector, but sometimes he's directing us how to be protected and we're not listening. These, these are the messages that... Um, these are the messages that we are getting. And how do you relate to this? It's very challenging, but what does it do to you? It drives you, it, it, it pushes you in a certain direction. Why? Because you become afraid. But why do you become afraid? Because the message, the messages say, you might depend on God, but God is not a dependable person to depend on. That is what the messages are saying. They are saying, you might depend on God, but God is not dependable. It is, it is dangerous to put your trust in God. And here are examples, Adventist ministers, here are examples of people who know God and people who put their trust in God and see what happened. These are very, very strong reasons to, to not believe, to have a weak faith. And yet, how do we respond? Because what we know is that these things did happen. And they are not the only cases. You can find dozens of them being sent around in the different forums every day. As challenging as it is, half of the answer is brothers and sisters, where are you keeping your eyes? That's half of the answer. Where are you keeping your eyes? I want you to, to, to remember what Jesus said. All right? His disciples came to wake up Jesus because they were on the sea. It was, it was in the middle of a storm. And Jesus was fast asleep. And of course, they ran to him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And his rebuke was, oh, you of little faith. Little faith in what? Little faith in God. Little faith in the presence of the Son of God. The Son of God is in the boat. And come on, be reasonable. God's Son is in the boat. And God is going to make all of them drown in the boat with his Son in the boat. What are they thinking? What are they thinking? Why are they thinking this way? Because their eyes are on the waves instead of on the Lord. They're not thinking reasonably or logically because the, the, the raging of, of, of the elements blinded their eyes. And that is what happens to God's people. We are, we are blinded by the elements. We are blinded by the, the media. We are blinded by the blitz that hits us from every direction. And we see the monster 
instead of seeing the God who is above all, instead of, instead of seeing the God who is with us, no matter what, he's always with us. That is his promise. It's the way, it's the way things are. You know, I kind of, I kind of compare, I'm, I'm comparing it to what happened in the, in the days of Hezekiah. The Assyrian army came and they surrounded Jerusalem. Look here. The Assyrians had defeated everybody. They had, they had overthrown so many of the nations around them. Now they come to, 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 the, to, to, to Judah and they surround Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is besieged. They close up the, the, the walls, they close up the gates, and they are locked inside. And there comes the emissary from the Assyrian king. He stands and he says, it says, then Rabshake stood and he cried with a loud voice in the Jews language. And he spake saying, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Jehovah, saying, the Jehovah will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. This, this is to me represents the media. It represents the spirit of the world. It represents those who have conquered everybody. Those who have determined a certain way that everybody must go. And they come to the people of God and they say, are you stupid? Are you crazy? Has anybody been able to stand against this? What makes you think you're God? And do something different. And he, he makes sure that the people hear. Why is he doing this? He is trying to strike fear into their hearts. He wants them to turn against Hezekiah. He wants them to, to come out of the city and surrender to the Assyrian king. They are sure that this, this Jehovah won't be able to do anything. The Bible tells you that Hezekiah went to the Lord and he spread out it. He went to send to the prophet Isaiah and he spread out his cause before the Lord. That night, an angel of the Lord came. 185,000 Assyrians were dead by morning. Not 185, not 1,850, 185,000 Assyrians were dead by the next morning. They went home with their, those that were left went home with their tails tucked between their legs. Abandoned. Their, their, their cause because for those who trusted in him, the Lord revealed that there is a God in Israel. He revealed that there is a living God and that those who no, put their trust the in him, that those who put their trust in him not will not be ashamed. What I find among many of my Christian friends who are living in this kind of fear, what they say is, God may not deliver you. What, what, their, what their, their, their word and their action says is, God may not deliver you. You need to find a way to deliver yourself. I want you to think about that. God may not deliver you, so you need to find a way to deliver yourself. If I follow that principle, you know what I would do? I would buy a gun. I would hire a bodyguard if I follow that principle. Why not buy a gun? Because if, 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 if as a Christian, there is the possibility that God is going to let me down, I need to do something, okay? If God's will is to let me down, I need to do something to overturn the will of God. I need to find a way to defend myself. I've thought about this many times. I look at I look at myself. I am five foot seven. I weigh about 130 pounds if I am that much. I can't defend myself. Who am I to defend myself? Who am I to get along in this world? I don't have I don't have a doctorate. I don't have I don't have a degree. I don't have I don't have a lot of money. Who am I? To defend myself or depend on myself. If I, if I were to to think like 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 many of these Christians, I would go out and buy a gun, and I would make sure to start from now to plan how 
I'm going to take care of myself financially in my old age. I put my trust in God. But what if God lets me down? What if God lets me down? I need to make sure I'm taken care of and my future is looked after because God is a person who might let you down at the most critical moment. This is the kind of God I see many people depending on, uh, um, many people presenting. This is the kind of God I see them presenting. And I just am afraid to make my thinking of God deteriorate in that direction. I would be afraid to trust a God like this. For many people, God, trusting in God is like a lottery. You say, I can trust him, but what if he fails and you take out some insurance in case God lets you down? That's the brand of Christianity I see many people promoting. I want to, 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 to look at a passage in the Bible that kind of brings out how God thinks about something like this. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Asa was, he was more or less a good king, more or less. But it happens so many times that you live as a Christian or you live as a child of God and then you take a wrong turn. In the 36th year of Asa, the good king, Baasha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah and he built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, the king of Judah. He besieged Judah. The, 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 the northern king, the ten tribes came and made war against the other three tribes and he wouldn't let anybody go out or come in. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and he sent to Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus. So what Asa did, he took money out of the temple and also his own money. And he sent it to a third king, Ben-Hadad, who was the king of Syria. Now it's Israel who comes to make war against Judah. Judah collects up a lot of money and sends it to another king called Ben-Hadad, who was from the nation of Syria. And what does he say to Ben-Hadad? He says, there is a league between me and thee. There's an agreement between you and me. There, there's a covenant between you and me as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go, break your agreement with Baasha, the king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So what did Baasha do? He got some money. He went and he sent captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They smote Aijan and Dan and abel Maim and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and he let his work cease. So what happened is that when the Syrian king went and made war against the cities of Israel, the Israelite king who was besieging Judah, he had to turn, turn around and go home. So Asa's problem was solved because he sought help from a heathen king. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa the king of Judah and said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on Jehovah thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a great host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. Let me read that again. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth thou shalt have wars. What was Asa's crime? What did he do wrong? He trusted in a human solution instead of going to God. Well, if my enemy comes against me and he has his armies and he's building a force against me to besiege me and overthrow my city, what is wrong if I send to somebody to help me? What is wrong if I have a friend and I send to the friend to help me? God said to Asa, You have done foolishly why 
because he put his trust in human solution instead of in God. And Asa had gone so far that what he did, he put, he put the prophet in a prison house. Look what it ended up saying about Asa a few verses later in verse 12. And Asa in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Is the Bible complimenting Asa when it says this? It's just a comment, but you can draw your own conclusion. And, and you ask the question, why did Asa come to this problem and he did not seek the Lord? You know why? Because he trained himself to depend upon human help. He got himself into that mode where he was so dependent upon humanity when it came to the last moments of his life. And he became physically diseased. He could not call upon God. You have learned to trust in the ways of the world. Naturally, that's where you are going to go. Whatever happens, you may call yourself a child of God. You may call yourself a Christian, but you find yourself turning to the solutions of men because that is how you have been trained. That's how you have trained yourself to respond to crises. There is a reason for fearlessness, brothers and sisters. I'm going to read a couple of passages from the Psalms. These are exceedingly challenging. As I read through them, I was so challenged, even though I know them like the back of my hand. But reading them again with a certain, in a certain frame of mind, listen, Psalm 46, everybody knows it. God is our refuge and our strength. Do you dare believe this? Do you just read the Bible for entertainment? Is it just a nice book with, with poetic words? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear? That is the reason why we are not afraid. That is the reason why we are not afraid. Not because we are big and strong or because we are full of bravado or because our, our fear gene has been taken away. No, we don't fear because God is our refuge. Because we depend on God. We trust in God. We have him as our hiding place. Why should I be afraid when the greatest person in existence who controls every element in the palm of his hands, when he is my friend, why should I be afraid? Amen. Even if the earth Amen. is removed Amen. and the mountains are carried into the midst of the sea, we will not be afraid. God has a solution for everything. There's no disease. There's no, there's no criminal. There's no financial need. There's nothing that our Father has not provided for us for. There's nothing. And fear is a, is a statement that says, I am listening to Satan more than I'm listening to God. I heard, I heard an Adventist preacher use a phrase some time ago. I've never forgotten it because it is true. And I think it's appropriate here. Maybe he didn't even understand what he was saying, but let me repeat it. It says, God's pathways are not designed for the faithless. Now, why am I saying this? Because look here. I'm not going to suggest to you that Pastor Cleghorn was not a Christian. The, the vice president of the Northern Caribbean University. I'm not going to suggest he was not a Christian. The other pastor that, that wrote that letter that talked about himself and his family just barely surviving and encouraging everybody to get, get the vaccination. Well, his statement, the statement in the letter, the statement in the letter, if you don't get the vaccine and you get COVID, then there's no help for you. That alone makes me question this man's Christianity. But I'm, I'm not here to, to pass judgment on people. But this is one thing I know. And I'm going to repeat it because it's true. God's pathways are not designed for the faithless. I'm not going to say 
if I see somebody who says he's a Christian and he puts his trust in God and he's, he fails, I'm not going to say God failed. It's easier for me to say your Christianity was not real. I'm not going to say God failed. You know, Jacob, Jacob, when he was in his last days, he referred to the God, he referred to God as the angel that carried me all the days of my youth. Something like that. I don't remember the exact words. But 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 when I think of my life, this is how I think too. The messenger that carried me all the days of my life. When God has been with, with, with me for 46 years, I can look back over those 46 years and I see so many interventions by God. Some of them, people might say it's coincidence. Some of them are beyond coincidence. I have seen the hand of God and I know the goodness of God. Then you come along and you say, I put my trust in God. And I ended up in disaster. Your experience is going to define my attitude to God. How could that make sense? I don't know what your relationship with God is, but I know what my relationship is. This is a challenge we have to build ourselves, to lock ourselves in a place with God that is so personal and private. Nobody can intrude there. No information can intrude there. Let the heavens fall. My God is faithful and I will live and die with that. And nothing can get that out of me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I resent this devil controlled planet that is systematically eroding people's confidence in God. And Christians need to be on the lookout because Satan is 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 trying to overwhelm us step by step and he's having great success with many of us let me turn to the passage Amen. that i really wanted to get to from psalm 91 i learned this psalm the second year after i became a christian i have to revise it because it's, my mind is not as sharp in my mind anymore but it is i, I i'm sorry that the credit for who wrote this psalm is not given. I know Asaph wrote some wonderful psalms. I know David wrote some amazing psalms. I think it was one of them. Maybe it was David who wrote this psalm, Psalm 91. But I'm just going to look at a few verses and take them step by step. And as we read, I want you to consider, brothers and sisters, is this really the word of God? Is this really the word of God? I know that as we read, half of your mind might be saying, yes, but I know Christians who believed in this and they ended up dead or they ended up in disaster. Unbelief bombarding us because of the things we have heard. This is the challenge we have, whether we can believe God or whether we believe the things that we hear and the things we have read and the things that other people have said. This is the challenge we have. Can we believe God? If we have a challenge believing God, then know that we need to make some revolutionary changes and to make those changes immediately. Because every time you come into a place where God's people are tested, it is always a test of faith. And it is always that the, the, the enemies of the kingdom work with all their might to overthrow our faith. This is what our father says. He who lives in the secret place of the Most High will remain under the shadow of the Almighty. To dwell means to live. The person who remains in God's secret place. And I so love that phrase. Why? Because even though we are here this morning worshiping publicly brothers and sisters, the real source of your strength as a Christian is the secret place of the Most High. And I'm telling you, if you are not much into quiet time alone with the Lord, your Christian experience will be weak. 
Every one of us, we need to spend time alone with God. We need to spend time with God as our friend. We need to cement ourselves into that relationship. Nothing in your life is as important as this. If you are not finding time to pray, stop doing something. Stop eating food. Stop reading on the internet. Stop doing something and go and make time to be with the Lord because without this, you have no foundation. So, when I hear of Christians trusting in God and dying, I ask myself, okay, they're called by the name Christian. Are they the people who dwell in the secret place of the Most High? Let me correct myself. I'm not saying Christians can't die. That's not what I'm suggesting. Christians die. Every Christian who ever lived died. And some of them were, were martyred crucified, eaten by wild beasts. So that's not the point I'm making. Let me put it another way. Those who put their trust in the Lord and they think that the Lord fails them, they will be of those who are not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. I will say of Jehovah, he is my refuge and my fortress. Yes, what does a refuge and a fortress imply? He is a place I run to for safety. He is where I go when I see trouble approaching. I go to my Lord. I go to Jehovah. He is my refuge, my hiding place. He is my fortress. I'm not going to run to the Syrians. I'm not going to run to the hospital. I'm not going to run to the doctor. I'm not going to go to my friends. I'm going to God. He is my refuge and my fortress. Anything that I do after that, it will be because he tells me to do it. I'm not going there without my God. I'm not doing anything without my God. What kind of Christian am I when in a moment of crisis I run to something and think of God secondly? Surely, absolutely, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And the fowler is the person who is, who is plotting to take your life, who has set a trap for your feet. But notice also, especially in this time, and from the noisome pestilence, the pestilence is the plague, it is the disease. It is COVID-19. He will deliver you. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under, under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. What is your defense? The shield and the buckler. These are the things you use to defend yourself in war, war time. The shield and the buckler is his truth. And what is the truth? The truth is God's love for you, God's concern for you, God's protection over you. These are the things that you put your defense in. Let me hurry through. I know that my time is running down. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flyeth by day. All right? The terror by night, those of us who live in, in, in certain places in the world, we can understand this. There are certain places where you have, you, you have your house sealed at night. You have the burglar bars around, and you have to be cowering because of the criminal and the gunman who might break through in the night. God says you won't be afraid for this, nor for the arrow that flies by day. The, 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 the things that cause people to live like fear, fearful chickens don't affect you. You walk with your head high and you don't have to be looking over your shoulders. Why? Because you have God. This is a phrase I find myself using over and over these days. I have a God. Hallelujah. I have a God. He's my father. He's my friend. But I, I, I keep I keep saying, every time something comes up, I say, I have a God. And what I'm implying is, I don't know what you have. I don't know what you have. I see the fear in your eyes. I hear the alarm in your voice. I see the trouble on your face. I have a God. And every Christian holds to this, and they, they hold it close to their bosom. I have a God. If you don't have a God, brothers and sisters, go and get every human protection you can get because you are in trouble if you don't have a God. And here's what it says in verse 7. 
This is the point, brothers and sisters. A thousand shall fall at thy side. So hold on. This Adventist pastor die. This 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 Christian died. That Christian almost came to the door of death. What does that have to do with me? A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So you might ask a question. But Brother David, is this not the same thing that those Christians were saying? They were saying the same thing. And they felt they were saying the same thing and it came near to them. They were saying the same thing and they ended up in disaster. So, so what do what right do you have to think that you can take this and it works out differently from you? Are you saying you are better than other Christians? Here's what I answer to that, brothers and sisters. I have no idea what your religious experience is. I have no idea. If I begin to judge my Christianity, if I begin to judge my God based on your experience, I am in grave danger. I don't know of anybody's experience apart from mine. And my experience and my awareness of the word of God is the only basis on which I can know and put my trust in God. That's what I will say. I'm not judging anybody else, but I'm telling you, if you don't want to, to believe the word of God, if you feel that God will fail and let you down, that's your business. What is my business? My business is to determine for myself if I can believe and put my trust in God, absolutely. The thing is, brothers and sisters, every time a person says this, you know what happens? You must be prepared to die for your belief. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, King, if it be so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. If it be so, we are not telling you that we can't die. We are not telling you that God might not make us die in the fire. But look here, King, you and your image go to the devil because we won't be bowing to your image today or any day. But no matter what happened, they knew that they were in the hands of God. No matter what happened, they knew that their father was there. They knew that their God was there. And nothing could happen to them unless God wanted it. And if God wants it, why would I be against it? If God wants it, why would I be against it? Now, now, now see, see the point. God says a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near you. Who is he talking to? Look at who he's talking to. Look at verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, your dwelling place. God is not talking to everybody. So I don't know who you are that claimed this promise and you got let down. I don't know who you are, but I know this. God is not talking to everybody. God is talking to those who have made God their dwelling place. Those are the people this is talking to. I don't know about anybody else up at NCU or anywhere else. I don't know about you. I know there are a lot of religious people who call the name of God. But God is talking to those who have made him their dwelling place. These are the ones who are locked into that special place with God. They dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And God says, because you have made me your refuge, nothing can touch you. He says, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Again, verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me. Hallelujah. This is the reason, brothers and sisters. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. I love it. I love it. 
God's pathways are not designed for the faithless. God's promises are not for the unbelieving. God's promises are not for those who simply profess and use the word God. God's promises are for those who set their love upon him, those who have known his name, those who have made him their, made him their dwelling place. These are the ones who will see the salvation of God. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, where I begin is where I end. We live in a troublesome time, troubling time. The greatest danger we face is the danger of losing our faith. Hear what I say. The greatest danger we lose, we face, is the danger of facing, uh, of losing our faith. The devil and his agencies in this world have conspired to do everything that is possible to destroy our faith. The challenge you and I have as Christians is to determine that by God's grace, this will not happen to me. I'm not going to lose my faith. I'm going to grow stronger in faith. I'm going to defy the agencies that would try to erode that faith. But I will tell you, when we take this position, we should also be prepared to die. We should be prepared to die. If we are not prepared to die for the Lord, it will not be possible to live for the Lord. So let us be prepared. We are living in serious times and we have to think about this in a very serious way. But I praise God that whether we live or whether we die, God is faithful. God's word is true. And they that put their trust in him shall not be ashamed. 